Welcome to the Rock the Stage Show. Each week, international media expert Rich Bontrager has in-depth and personal conversations with celebrities, top leaders, authors, speakers, and media professionals. Now, from the Rock the Stage studios, here's your host, the Trigger, Rich Bontrager. Welcome back Sunday night to another edition of Rock the Stage Show. Great to have you with us here tonight. Whether you're on PPN or whether on our YouTube streaming channel, where right now there's a live chat party going on and people are typing that little chat box and having a good time and jumping into another edition of Rock to Stage Show. We love being here each and every week and bringing you amazing guests and topics. And tonight we're going to get into one that's really relevant for about everybody, I think, in the world. We're going to get into the world of AI. Technology is rapidly advancing. It's moving into every sector of our lives and every sector of our businesses. AI is becoming more and more a part of the business world. But many people are asking, where will AI take my business? And they're also asking, maybe the biggest question right now about all this is, how can AI help my sales? But here's what I think. The trick in all this is to protect you, your brand, your uniqueness, while streamlining with AI to be more effective. Sometimes there's been a collision with that because we want AI to do everything with us and then they forget who we really are. We are the product, we are the voice, we are the owner. And AI right now seems to be taking over some of that. Doesn't need to. Today we're gonna get into a great conversation about all of that and much more, I'm sure. Chad Brewermeister is an entrepreneur, author, and sales expert. He's also the founder of BDR.AI. And he's the director of business development at Informatech and the leader of AI for Data. He's also the host of the AI for Sales podcast. He shares insights on AI integration in sales beyond and beyond business. Chad also hosts the You Matter to Christ podcast, blending faith and business. And he contributes to the Ignite Christian Business, underscoring his dedication to spiritual growth and business and AI Chad Brewermaster, he does it all, and here comes Chad to rock the stage show tonight. Great to be <laughs> here. To have you, Chad. How are you, Rich? I am doing marvelous. It's been a little while. You and I have bounced around in you know, different circles back and forth, but it's great to have you here tonight. Yeah, well, it's great to be here. Whenever I ride a bike and I see a, a handle with your last name on it, I always think of you these days, but uh, I <laughs> doubt you're related to the handlebar uh, grip people. <laughs> no, growing up though, tires. the Bond Trigger bikes were so big growing up, and people would ask that question a lot. And growing up in Elkhart, Indiana, the question was, are you Bond Trigger bikes? Are you the Bond Trigger pools? Or is your dad the judge? And I said, my dad's the judge. And then the conversation oh, was okay. done. <laughs> well, you were one of three. That's great. That's <laughs> love it. Love it. So you have been in this whole technology world for a long time entrepreneur author sales expert just from an overview as we get rolling here tonight what drew you to this whole technology world and what do you think about where we're at you know when i graduated from college i went into transportation sales it just was kind of natural you know i interviewed for a handful of companies got the job and uh it was it was great the Downside of it is that there's seven to 10% margins. And so I remember one leader pulled me aside, Philip, and said, Chad, you're never going to get rich in a company like this because it's just it, what it is. And I was like, and he said, you're a go getter and a hustler. So if you want to get rich, you know, you can use this as a launch pad, but may not be where you want to end up. And um, so I, I stuck with that. From one company to FedEx, I started with Airborne, then I went to FedEx, and I did that for about three and a half years. And then I wrote a paper on in my MBA at Loyola Marymount University in Southern California, and I compared traditional Fortune 1000 to tech. And I got to interview a lot of really good people, smart CEO of a company uh, that I interviewed. Uh, Dick McCormick was the CEO, I believe, of U.S. West, big communications company. Yeah. 
and he was in Europe at the time. So it was like midnight his time and I'm calling him in the day and he took the call, right? Cause I used to be his caddy at my country club as a kid. And so I interviewed him and I said, Hey, you know, what are your thoughts on tech versus traditional fortune 1000? And he said, well, Chad, I'll tell you what I told my daughter. It's actually more risky for you to stay in traditional than it is in tech. And I was like, that's where it clicked for me. Like, oh, wait a minute. Because traditional can have a curve that goes down over time, right? Shipping, yep. uh, everything changes over time. Tech is always reinventing the next big thing. And tech is always evolving. And I joke about this, but I, I know there's truth, but they'll never tell you this. We get the brand new iPhone and they're all excited about the brand new iPhone. And I get my iPhone. I'm excited about my new phone, but I know in my head, there are two iterations ahead of us already, but they're not telling us that. That's how fast it's moving, right? Yeah. I mean, I just bought an iPhone 16 for my son this morning. His birthday's yep. in two days. And um, yeah, I got to go pick it up this afternoon at the, at the local mall. So um, you're exactly right. It, it moves so fast. And you asked a question, the second part of your other question was, yeah. I've had 200 guests on my podcast in the last five years talking about AI. And one said it well, I said, you know, do you think AI is going to be like, how big is it compared to other things? Is it, you know, like the internet is what most people compare it to. Think of what yeah. the internet did for us. And he said, Chad, no, this don't compare it to the internet, compare it to electricity. Like this is a massive shift in everything. And so, you know, I don't know when electricity came out, but uh, it was a lot longer than the internet and probably made a lot more impact when you can turn a light switch on and you can turn on energy. So, wow. That's kind of big deal. Yeah. So, yeah, that boggles my mind to think about that analogy, but that is extremely powerful because, but then People are worried, are we going to the route of Terminator? Or are we going the route of Skynet? Where are we going to be able to maintain control and still succeed? Or will AI be the thing that really tells us what the new now and we're well, going and on that's, the mass of that's the, a of legitimately kingdom. good question, right? I think a lot of times movies are leading indicators to what's to come. So yeah. I don't think they put those out by accident. I think it was kind of smart people and creative people thinking about where the future could go. Yeah. There's a guy named Chris Wright, who is the CEO and founder of the AI Trust Council. He was a fighter pilot in the military and he flew helicopters. And when he started seeing the military outsource kill shot decisions to AI, that's when he called a timeout and said, okay, I, if we're gonna do this in the military, then I need to go form a council of police, firefighters, military, and we need to bring people together to start talking about how do we put in guardrails so that we're not wiped out? Because he views it as we're, we're not far away from Terminator type decisions yeah. if we don't do something about it. Well, and just like years ago when the records got more explicit and they had to put ratings on music. We keep hearing that the government's talking about some sort of guardrails, protection, ratings, uh, the whole idea of having fake skins, authentic you versus virtual you. There's a lot of talk, but I don't see the line moving yet on that. What, what's holding us from doing something now versus waiting till we're in the deep weeds and we're stuck? Well, it's interesting because having interviewed so many people over five years, I wrote a book called AI for Sales years ago, and having interviewed so many people, what I started to see is that the AI is only as good as the data that is underneath the AI. Yep. And so that's why I joined Informatica six months ago, because there's tools called Master Data Management or MDM, Data Governance data integration. So how do you pull different systems, internal and external? How do you govern that data? Like, you know, who is Chad Burmeister? He wrote a book. He's a director. He's other company. How do you know and rationalize who can see the information about your products yes. and your suppliers? And so all these, all this big data 
needs to be governed. It's like the underbelly of an iceberg. You just see the right. sexy part of AI is, but the most important part is the data governance underneath the surface. So well, and, I, I, yeah. it's very interesting having gotten into this. Well, well, and again, I'm producing shows every week, if not twice a week. I'm interviewing people like you. They've got so much value of my voice, my face, everything out there on the internet. Who's to say they can't grab some of that right now and make a virtual trigger without my permission? Yeah, well, and that was a scary there. one. I, I'm knowledgeable in this area. And when you get one of those spam emails, this is phishing, and you click the phishing button, like that's pretty easy for me to see because I've seen it over decades. Um, I, I watched one on YouTube the other day. There was Elon Musk talking about a, a conversation that he had with Donald Trump. And I was like, well, this is interesting. And it said live. And I was like, huh, I want to see what he talked about. Like, let's figure this out. And so he starts talking about crypto. And it was a crypto discussion. So he's yeah. talking about it. I'm sucked in for like 15 minutes. The words were slightly off. And I was, my spidey sense was going, hmm, I wonder what, but it says live. So I go, let me check my phone. YouTube. Same live feed is on my phone. I'm like, okay, it's valid. So about, about 20 minutes into this dang thing, and there were some questionable statements that he was making. You know, he was saying, yep. you know, when crypto really gets deployed, we'll be able to catch the bad guys because we'll see every transaction under the sun. And, and I'm just like, wait, you mean you're going to be big brother on everything? And yeah. I, it just something wasn't landing with my soul going, why would Elon say this? Well, then he goes, all right, to get crypto to really take off, if you send me up to $1 million in crypto right now. You can do $10, you can do 100000 whatever you want, up to a million. <laughs> I will send it back double. And I was like, wow. And you could do Dogecoin, Ethereum, or Bitcoin. <laughs> and, and it had a barcode for each. So I scanned the barcode. Wow, this is, I mean, you could test it with 50 bucks or something. And right. then I texted my friend Sean and I said, Sean, I don't know if this is true, but I know it's blown up. Because I told him to buy it like 10 years ago and it's been do it did really well over 10 years. Yeah. And so he goes, he go back, read it. And you know, and I'm like, wait, I'm the ultimate measure of this stuff. And I just got duped. <laughs> and I almost had my brother and my dad test it too. And then I said, time out, time out, don't do it. It's it's all fake. So how does YouTube allow that to go right. on since March of this year is when it came right. out? That, and yeah. that's one of the biggest fears of people in business. So they're going to produce something, put it out there. How do I know it's legit? They are going to say, swipe here, Bitcoin here, do something at the end of it, a call to action. And you don't know right now that the trust factor is very weak, I think. Yeah. From where we're at already to where we're going. So what are you hearing about safeguards? What are they going to implement? And when are they going to implement it? Well... I'm optimistic if Elon Musk plays any kind of a role. He's a forward thinker on all of this stuff. And there's a lot of smart people in AI. That As a country, we have First Amendment rights of free speech. And we have Second Amendment and Third and all these amendments that protect individual rights. Let me go back to Chris Wright for a second. Because yeah, he said that there's a percentage of people that's larger than you might expect that when asked the question, are you pro-human or not, there's a large percent of people who will actually, in their heart of hearts and in their gut, they are not pro-human. And so I didn't believe him when he told me. I was like, wait a second, what are you talking about? And he goes, just, and he gives me a series of two or three questions, but one of those three questions is, are you pro-human? And so I asked this person on a podcast, I said, so, you know, this is a weird question, but I've never asked it. I'd be really curious what your thought would be. She goes, well, let me just put it this way, Chad. I was like a D and C student in high school. I failed out. Then I went and got my master's. And I'm then I moved to New York from California and blah, blah, blah. And, and she said, um, here's my thought. Religions are all about war and people do things and that it's bad. Humans are generally bad. And she said, if it's our time as a human race to be extinct or taken over by an AI, then it serves us right as a human, as a human race. And I was like, okay, that doesn't compute from my thinking. 
because it's a computer. It's a little, it used to be a floppy drive and now it's, it's a computer. How are you willing at this moment in time to just relinquish the keys to eternity to a robot? So, and that, and you'd be surprised at the percentage of people that are like, Hey, I've been burned by life. I'm just, it's okay. If AI took over. You're, you're, you're absolutely blowing my mind right now because the, the idea of the question alone, the way it's framed is scary as all get out right there. I mean, the question alone. Well, think about what you could do. Like one of the things I had him some Tim from Attica, and they had a, him on a live webinar with a thousand people tuned in. You know, it's hard to get a thousand people at a webinar these days. Yeah. But oh, yeah. he was the primary uh, go to go to speaker. And he talked about these kinds of topics. And it was it was very interesting to see some of the questions that were coming up. And, you know, how do we prevent this? Um, where him and I, because he's been a customer of mine for a year and a half. So we talk every so often. And where, where, where I kind of went with it is, what if you could put the Constitution or the human protective elements, right, the amendments and everything, into mm -hmm. the AI that just says, hey, before we as, a, as an AI need, can make a decision, we need to run it up against all items, all of those check boxes and go, okay, I can take this action because it, it is pro human. And that's where I'm like, I think this does evolve. You have a, it's like a operator. It's like a car. Let's talk about it like that. A governor on a car, right? right. Hey, the car could go to 120. I remember having a Nissan Sentra and I, in the desert, you know, I would test it. <laughs> and at, at 110, it would go, Voo, and it would just drop back down to a hundred. And so we need some kind of governor as it relates to ethics. So this takes me back to my question. They keep talking about the governor, about something that's going to be out there to help protect us. And I'm not seeing it. No, I don't see it yet. Um, it, it, to me, it's kind of like one of those things, right? Government, what has to happen is you need to see a few fractures occur before someone throws a flag on the play. Okay, so we've had phones. A million okay, dollars phone get sent to the fake Elon. Well, right, 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 well, but how many phone systems do we need to have go down? How many yeah. times do we need to have the internet's down here on this part of the world today? But don't worry, I'll be back up this afternoon. You've already had those, and no one's jumping on this saying, we need to call a timeout and fix it. Yeah, we need to get a lot of smart people in a room and work on this project. NASA was able to spend a rocket to the moon. This this is one of those points in history where NASA or a new entity, you know, the AI Trust Council, needs to be able to get together and have this conversation. And it's complex because it does get to play God in the AI system because there's all different opinions on. Right you know, on, on the, on the layout of the land. So it's, uh, it's interesting times, very so interesting times. You, you, you do have an amazing podcast. Your, your AI for sales uh, podcast has been going. You, you said you've had amazing guests on and things like that. What is the common Joe asking? What are people wanting to hear? Because you've been interviewing and interviewed. Where's the trends? Where's the hot buttons? What are they right now? Um, Early seven years ago, when I launched BDR AI, it was formerly called ScaleX. And then I bought BDR AI and SDR.AI. Momentum that I had in the ScaleX.AI land and said, hey, I've been holding these two domains for a long time. You seem like the person I could pass the torch to. And so I picked those domains up. And my early vision for the for the business was how do I take hours of work and make it minutes? How do I take mediocre work and make it amazing? And yes. so that's that's what the early versions of AI do. So Nova.ai was out of San Francisco. I partnered them and they would they have an Outlook plugin and a Gmail plugin. They they since sold and they don't have this service anymore, but it would go research your profile on LinkedIn and other places. It would look at the weather. It would look at if we went to the same college or not. 
all the different things that would take a human hours to research, and it would be done in about 10 seconds. So right before I was ready to click the email, it would write the first sentence. Hey, Rich, I see it's cold in fill in the blank city. Yep. I hope you're staying warm. And just that one you know, if you get too cheesy, hey, we went to the same school, blah, blah, blah. You have to be human and be short, but you have to be relevant. And so people on my sales team had a problem with it. I was like, why aren't you guys personalizing the first sentence as a person? Yeah. And I stood up for the whole, you know why? I was like, yeah, I think I'm entitled. You know, it was like <laughs> few good men. I think I'm entitled to know why. I'm the leader. Why is it? And he said, we don't know these people, Chad. We don't want to go write something about going to college or their weather because we don't know them yet. So how could we do that? And I said, well, let me, I can tell you why, because you're going to get a three to five times better reply rate. You're going to triple your pipeline. And it was like, yeah, but we just we don't have the time. We don't have the desire. And I was like, oh, got it. So that's why I left the big Fortune 1000 company and went out to pursue AI in the first place was to solve for that problem. So I like the response of the people on your team that stood up and challenged you on that because I don't want a warm, fuzzy email the first time you contact me. I don't want to say, hey, I think we went to the same school or, you know what, I, you know, blah, blah. There's something about the first introduction does need to have a little bit of a hesitation to check the pulse, I think, invite you in versus just, Hi, I know where you are and what, where you yeah, live. In yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to be careful with it, you know. One of the emails that went out in that time was to a CEO of a company, um, to no, to someone else, a VP at a company, VP of sales, let's say. And it said, congratulations, I saw your CEO in the news. Well, the AI was not smart enough and the CEO had passed away. So imagine getting an email. Oh, I just saw your CEO. Congrats, he was in the news. The person responded, Dad, I don't know why you would be congratulating us that our CEO just passed away, but this is probably you used an automation. Oh. And right. So think about just that one little. And then I was on a panel with HP, IBM and Google or something. It was in University of Houston, probably six, yeah. six years ago. And I'm on a panel and I shared that story. And these are all AI related people. And, and they were like, I'm sure they took that back to the shop and said, OK, make sure we solve for this. But that's just one small use case. Think yes. of the millions of variations that as humans are programmed into our brains and into our hearts and our souls. Yes. Man, that's going to take a long time to be able to hand off all of that. Look, I just. I don't know if a computer can be built like a human. <laughs> well, that, that that's a hundred thousand dollar question. Uh, you know, and there's a line going through my head right now, just from what we were talking about earlier, but I'm going to geek out for you for, for a moment. So just, just, just hang with me. But in the recent plan, the eight movie, it comes down to the tension of humans have screwed it up. The apes are now ruling. And the question of the film is, is it time to hand it over to the apes? Because maybe they do, can do a better job than we did. That's the theme of the movie. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're asking the Which same question about AI. Have the we word come AI up for apes? It would be the same, the same question. Yeah. yeah. So, so here's where Chris's perspective is. Yeah. Humans are to an ant. So an ant pile, you could put a gas on it and just light the whole ant pile. You could step on an ant. It's just instant gone, right? That whole ant pile gone. AI is to humans as humans are to ants. Oh, yeah. And But times 1,000. So it'll be such a dramatic difference in capability that, man, and we as humans, we, you know, we, we tend to want more at the expense of and there's so many things that whoever's behind that AI, whatever that AI is, whether it's running a government or a company or any of it, um, it doesn't end well. It 
So I, I, I'm a, in this sense, I'm a little more pessimistic than optimistic about the long-term gains of AI. Short-term, right. it's amazing. <laughs> well, well, and yeah. recently I've been doing a major live stream event. I use AI because I'm working with international leaders around the world on a live stream, different time zones. So I took AI and I gave it the prompt of like, I want to know when they're going to start their interview, finish their interview. I, I want this time zone and this time zone. And this. So I could have a whole spreadsheet so everyone would know which part of the world where they're coming and going. And AI, like you said, in five seconds gave me the whole run of show and it was done. Now, that's fabulous. That's where we can use this for business. Are we smart enough to realize we can use that even now? Are, business, are businesses aware of what they can do with AI right now? Um, it's interesting because the Informatica is an example, right? The CEO came out with a slogan and a phrase that's been used now. Everybody's ready for AI, except your data. And it, and it's really good. Hey, and you know, and who's the better data cleanup people than Informatica? Um, <laughs> but the projects that are out there being invested in it you would be amazed by. It's just going to grow by the billions and billions and billions for the next foreseeable future. So I do believe companies are using it. Let me give you an example. I was on another yeah. panel here in Denver with a mortgage guy, a CEO of a mortgage company. He had 400 mortgage brokers. They scaled, they ramped, and his rates were falling. They killed it, you know, and and he said, okay, every, and then we had this State Farm CMO in the room. We had Freddie Mac CMO in the room. It was 15 of the world's best, the country's best top CMOs. And I got invited to be a panelist on AI. And so this mortgage CEO said, guess how much it costs to fund a mortgage when you add up the people costs, the technology costs, all of it. And people were like 500 bucks, 1,000 bucks, whatever, right? Because it was $10,000. Yeah. Right? He said, what if I told you I got it down to $342? And it was like, wait a second. You're talking about 95% reduction in cost to deliver a mortgage? And he goes, so now think about the value of that. Think about the value of disrupting that industry. Yes. You can help people in parts of the community who need more help. You could, I mean, it's just such a disruptive thing. Our system that's been in place for 250 years has so many things that are in place to cause mm -hmm. $342 mortgage costs or health care. Or, so there's so much blockage between that. And I think that's what you're seeing in the world today. And that's why there's so much friction between the left and the right and all of the stuff going on, I think, has to do with we're about to unleash the most amazing balancing. Think of that, the, the value of the great leveler. I think AI could be the great leveler. You don't go to high school, but you've got a master's degree information available to you. So you just mentioned a 95% difference from that example. Part of that is also going to be People are going to be no longer needed because they're replaced and streamlined. So my question I always go to, I mean, right now, what about how many all those people? Well, where, where do we all go? Because yeah. even AI now is in your supermarket because you all self-scan. And it's tracking yeah. you personally and your credit card and everything else. Now we have more checkout with automated than we do human checkout. Where do we all go when AI simplifies, like you said, so the 95% of everyone on my podcast said, and that's, I asked it every time. Let, let me ask the elephant in the room question. 95%, oh, you won't be replaced by AI. You'll be replaced by people who know how to use AI. And that's the question. That's the answer we would like to be true as a leader, as a proponent of working people, all of it, right? right. Now, two recent counterexamples to that was one on my airplane back from Nashville this week. This guy named Kenny, who was in the game, made it out and is now a robotics worker for Amazon. 
and he's so articulate. He wants to be a deacon for the Catholic Church, like just a neat guy. We talked for an hour and a half. We were that group on the plane that are like, would you shut those two guys up? <laughs> <laughs> but I said, I told him this story. I said, hey, people tell me you'll be replaced by people who want to use AI, not by AI. He goes, I'll just tell you, and I, you know, this company, this big company that does sorting, I go, oh, I work for FedEx and it used to be done on gravity and it was like big arms that would move things across. Yeah. He goes, you should see the robotics that we set up. <laughs> He's like, we, there's, there's a handful of people that are there, not the hundreds that it used to take. So he said, I've seen firsthand. And I go, yeah, the, the people that are the workers on the East coast that are, you know, that, just went on strike for three or four days and then kicked yeah. the can by three months. Um, they're worried about automation taking their jobs. I, I, I did mention you're, you're also sharing your faith through your work and through your career. So I'm very interested. What is the faith community saying about all of this AI technology stuff? Having been a pastor, having been in the church, we're always so far behind everything. <laughs> we're like three years, four years behind. But what are you hearing on that side of the coin? Well, I have a friend named Joe Thomas who built a chat GPT plugin that's powered by biblical scripture and truth and everything. And so yep. he, a lot of the pastors are just kind of saying, no, that's the devil. I don't want to touch it. Um, but my view is when you equip a pastor with the truth so they can go in and I've been using this for about three months, I'll go to two Bible studies in a week and it'll ask a group asks a complex question that we have no idea how to handle. And you ask this AI and it reads it all from, and it'll say, do you want to know like what it really meant from the early days? Do you want to know what it meant in the next 500 years? Or do you want to know what it means today? And it, it's able to bifurcate that out. I think a lot of churches are going along with the flow of culture in today's world versus biblical truth. Yeah, which which historical data information and relevance is always fascinating to learn about that. Then I'm also concerned again that who are the gatekeepers that built the algorithm to tell you what it said? You know, because again, Bible translation, people are always confused that people are not translating accurate; they're translating the way they want it to be translated. Yeah. We're back to the same yeah, story yeah, now. Yeah. Is AI translating it the way it should be, or is it? translating the way it wants it. That's exactly right. And is it crowdsourced? And so if the crowd moves its opinion, does the AI move its opinion? And, and I, I think those are some of the questions that need to occur inside of this data governance, right? What is the black box that needs to go underneath this all? And the hard part, I think, is, hey, if you did it for a city or a town or a state or a U.S. or world how do you do it across the world? So I, I, I just, my personal wonder is maybe that's why this global idea is starting to come into play of a global government, you know, and a, a lot of the news and a lot of people that I know are like, oh, that would be terrible. It'd be crazy. <laughs> These are where the conversations are going, Chad. You know it and I know it. And this is what's going to be very interesting to see. We're, when do the watermarks pop up on things that yeah. are AI versus not AI. How are we going to yeah. let people know yeah. what's real? Well, what's and not even real. the news that would apply to, let's be honest, right? Yes. There's so many half truths and just in the last 48 hours, right? If you, if you, it's, we're getting closer to an election cycle. So there's things that are just clipped out of, out of place that are like, Hey, you did say it right, Rich. And they're like, yeah, I said every word in the entire English language for the last 50 years of my life. But yes. you can't just take the word A and put it with something else without why have you didn't you took it out of context. So I think there needs to be one one person had a business idea and said, hey, what if we just had a frame around our television that has a bunch of crowdsourcer people and then you have a score as a crowdsourcer? Like, hey, you know your stuff, and so you've got a 97.5% success rate and call them BS on stories, it would be neat to have a little frame around the outside to say, this one's generally true. Oh, this one's totally false. <laughs> I can see it now. The American Idol panel waiting for you, and you have your own personal Simon that calls you out. 
exactly right. Oh, Chad Brewmeister, it's been a pleasure to have you on here. How can people find you? What's the best email or website that you want people to come and find you and learn more I about? I would suggest what you want? go to my uh, my name, just as you see it on the screen. ChadBurmeister.com is where you can find the books that I've written, the the things I'm working on, whether it's from a faith perspective, business, AI, it's all there. And uh, ChadBurmeister.com, all my links to my socials are there as well. Chad Burmester, thanks for taking the time to be on Rock to Stage. Great seeing you again, too, by the way. Thank you, Rich. There you go. AI. We tried to rip it apart, put it back together. We probably make your brain hurt just a little bit more than before we started this show. But that's the new world that we live in right now. That's where we're struggling, but we're also excited at the same time about what it can do. I love to hear your thoughts. Drop them in the comments, the questions. Drop an email if you want to. Trigger at rocktostagemedia.com. I would love to hear feedback and always come back every Sunday night, 7 p.m. Eastern time as we have another amazing guest. We go around the world now in 17 different countries globally, and we're having actors, directors, writers, amazing technology people like Chad and others coming right here, give you interesting conversations, and you can join it every Sunday night on YouTube with our open chat, live stream party, and of course, you can always view us on PPN, the public place network thanks for dropping in tonight we'll see you back here once again for another edition of rock to stage show